in the words of a famous song, and don't worry, I'm not actually going to sing, it's getting hot in here, so take off all your EVs from a rapid charger so the battery doesn't explode? Wait. No. That's not right. The internet's been lying again, hasn't it? If you are in the Northern Hemisphere, the chances are you think it's hot outside right now. Like, super hot. Melt the runway hot. Cook an egg on the pavement hot. Or, for those in the UK, the wrong type of heat and the rails have buckled hot. While some of us might be enjoying the benefits of a well-timed heat pump installation and bucket loads of solar panels on the roof to keep everything powered, the reality is that for many people, too many people in fact, this summer is going to be pretty darned unbearable because anthropogenic climate change has decided it's payback time and we've only got ourselves to blame, I suppose. And because Google's algorithm knows that electric cars are literally the new hotness right now, what with a tank of petrol being more than half a day's salary for many people, and when the same amount of money could keep an EV on the road for several months, assuming you charge it home, that is, more and more people are starting to take notice of EVs. And that means more EV-centric content is being published than ever before. For channels like this one, that's great news. I mean, we've got more subscribers and more supporters than ever before. We've got more electric vehicles to test than ever before. And Michael RDP is genuinely starting to panic about how he's going to edit all the things as our press car booking is now stretching out through until the end of October. If you are a plug-in car driver, it's probably never felt so good to have dumped the pump. Except... In amongst all the awesome content, there's a rise in electric vehicle FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Kate and I have already taken on a fair amount of FUD in recent weeks, especially concerning the cost of ownership and just how clean electric cars are compared to fossil fueled ones. Today, though, we're going to focus on some of the myths surrounding EVs and hot weather. So sit down in front of a fan, grab your favourite freezer snack and let's bust some myths together. Myth number one. Electric cars can't stand the heat. We have heard a lot of this one in the last week, and it goes something like this. Electric car battery packs love to be about the same temperature as the majority of humans. And no, I'm not talking hot yoga or post-sauna ice bath cold. I'm talking about normal everyday room temperature. And if the temperature gets a lot warmer than that, bad things happen to the batteries, potentially causing irreparable damage to them. But like any myth that sticks around, there is a sliver of truth to this one. Back in 2010, when Nissan introduced the Leaf hatchback to the world, Renault was readying its Zoe electric car for launch, and Mitsubishi was still selling its little poached egg of iMiev, the majority of EVs out there didn't have active thermal management on their battery packs. The Nissan Leaf, for example, used passive cooling techniques to keep its battery pack cool by diverting air over and underneath the battery pack when the car was in motion. It didn't really work all that well though, and surprise, surprise, the Leaf is one of the few EVs out there today with a pretty poor reputation for looking after its batteries. There was even a massive court case in the US when Leaf owners in hot climates noticed their cars could no longer travel as far as they once could. That was caused by premature battery aging of the Leaf's original battery packs in states where the temperatures regularly stored to levels you and I would probably want to run inside and hide from. Luckily, those times have changed. The overwhelming majority of EVs on the market today use active cooling systems to keep their battery packs at a comfortable level when driving or parked, with the really fancy ones allowing your battery to heat up prior to rapid charging before then cooling the pack down to a more comfortable level after charging is complete, all to save you a bit of time at the charging station. The chances are that your EV has a liquid-cooled battery pack, so as long as your car has enough charge in its pack, it should keep itself healthy and cool in hot weather. 
but it doesn't hurt to plug in while parked if you can, since any power to keep the batteries cool will come from the mains, not from your battery pack. But that said, it's certainly not essential. Myth number two, you can't rapid charge in hot weather. <laughs> we hear this one regularly. The notion that you can't rapid charge an electric car in extremely hot weather because it will damage the car's battery pack and cats and dogs. And just like our first busted myth, this one again is related to poor battery performance in early electric cars, primarily the first generation Nissan Leaf, where a lack of active liquid thermal management meant that it was all too easy to get the battery pack all toasty warm on a hot summer day if you rapid charged multiple times. With no active thermal management, the battery pack could not keep itself properly cool in really hot weather, and that resulted in the aforementioned premature battery aging, meaning the car didn't travel as far per charge as it did when new. Nissan's answer in the second generation Leaf was to dramatically throttle quick charge power and speed when the battery pack was already hot, leading to the now famous rapid gate debacle, which we've made plenty of videos on in the past. Don't worry, I'll link to it here and below. But again, modern EV battery packs with appropriate thermal management don't suffer as much with rapid charging in hot weather. And as long as you keep your car's cooling system in good condition, just as you would need to with an internal combustion engine cooling system, you will be just fine. And while you do sometimes see charging stations ramp down charging power in really hot weather, that's due to the rapid charging station trying to keep itself cool a lot of the time, not the car. Myth busted. Myth number three, you'll have to choose between AC at home or charging your EV. This myth is closely connected to the one that suggests there's simply not enough power out there to run all the EV charging stations that we are going to need if the world transitions away from fossil fuels. Except in this case it doubles down and tells people that they'll either have to choose between a charging station for their EV or having air conditioning on in extreme weather. And I think this falsehood comes from the fact that people genuinely do not understand how electricity is measured and secondly they don't really understand how electrical load is calculated. While your average rapid charging station, as found in your local Walmart or shopping mall, might be capable of charging power levels of up to 350 kilowatts or more, your average home charging station usually maxes out somewhere between 6 and 10 kilowatts of instantaneous power drain. With only the super powerful home charging stations, like you might install if you've just got a Tesla, or if you have an EV with a super large battery pack, pulling more power. In North America, even the smallest of homes usually have around a 100 amp mains feed to the house, so hooking up a 6 or 10 kilowatt charging station still leaves plenty of room for other things, including AC. And with most AC systems consuming between 3 and 6 kilowatts, and that's a figure by the way for an older air system, heat pumps use far less energy than that, even combining an EV charging station and AC leaves you with plenty of power to spare. I personally have two heat pumps installed here at the studio, my house, and we charge three to four EVs daily, all with no worries, in super hot weather. Bye bye myth. Myth number four, running an EV's air conditioning will halve your range. Just like that last myth, this one is often perpetuated by folks who have absolutely no understanding of how electric vehicles work, or indeed, how electricity works. It's just that magic helper that hides in the wall. And in the winter, we hear the opposite myth make the rounds. You know, the one that says running a heater will halve your range in winter. Together, this is an example of a little knowledge is dangerous, because these do have a basis in fact. In an electric vehicle, everything you power has to take that power from the vehicle's battery pack. And the more power you use for other things in the car, the less energy you have available to move yourself along. However, the amount of energy you need to run an air conditioning system, or indeed your lights or your radio, is several orders of magnitude less than the power needed to move the car down the road. And an internal combustion engine's car AC is also powered from the energy it takes along, the fuel in the tank. 
So, if you're driving an internal combustion engine car and you turn the AC on, you will also notice a small drop in energy efficiency. The same is true for an EV. If you run the air conditioning, you're powering a small compressor from the battery pack and it will impact your range by anywhere from a few percent to 10% in the most extreme of situations, just as you would in a gas car. And when EVs only had a 100 mile range per charge, that impact might have been a big problem. But in modern EVs with several hundred mile ranges between charges, the chances are you're really not going to notice it unless you do a long distance road trip. And by the way, pro tip, because it takes more energy to change the temperature of something than it does to keep something at a constant temperature, you should, if there is a charging station available, use a preconditioning cycle while your car is still plugged into the mains in order to cool down the cabin before you leave. You will actually find you lose less energy that way than if you don't. Myth number five. Your EV will overheat in traffic. We are all familiar with the concept that internal combustion engine vehicles do not like sitting still in traffic. I mean, I've had my fair share of overheated engines over the years, not to mention vapor locks when I had my old Morris Miners. And this myth, based on what I can tell, comes from several instances where EVs caught fire on the public highway for reasons that weren't involving heat, essentially following an accident that punctured the car's battery pack on a hot day. And just like a fossil fuel car's fuel tank being breached, puncturing an EV's battery pack can lead to a fire. Look, I've done some research and for every myth about EVs burning up in hot weather, there seems to be an associated story about a battery pack getting damaged. In fact, one recent story covered on a local news outlet in California detailed a crashed Tesla whose battery pack caught fire several weeks after a collision while it was located in a junkyard. It just happened to be a hot day. But honestly, as we've covered many, many times before, an EV sitting in a traffic jam on a hot weather day is not going to just spontaneously catch fire. Sure, an older, non-active thermal managed battery pack in an older first generation EV may start to get a little warm, but not warm enough that it's gonna cause any problems. As usual then, these myths really are complete hogwash wrapped up as advice. And I hope that I've given you some of the tools you need today to bust them out next time someone tries to mention one. And that's it for today in... Seriously, do we have to go through this again? If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link in the video description. And if you really like today's video, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, please make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire crew, go out to everyone who makes this channel possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who watch and share the videos. If you are a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name right here. And if you've just joined, I'm sorry if your name isn't showing. We render out the list every week or so, and sometimes names aren't added as quickly as we would like. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Chris Maxwell, Pedro Moore-Pinchero, Patrick Boyarski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, Dave Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leon, Andrew Martin, Guido Trajota, Brophy Wolf, Tessa in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Dan Blair, Jim Burness, Chris Asenta, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And of course, super out of this world thanks to our Starman level supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Blue Says Hello, Kevin Burrowbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. If you'd like to be part of that amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below, you can hit the join button to support us on YouTube, or you can show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are below, you can buy t-shirts like this one. And know us that if you are just unable to support us financially, watching the video and sharing it really does make a difference to our ad revenue. Thanks for joining me and as always, keep evolving.